Hi everyone, my name is Carrie Schultz and I'm the host of a new monthly interview style podcast called Research in Scottish History. The idea behind this podcast is to highlight just some of the new research that's being done in all areas of the history of Scotland. So far we've had some great episodes on church discipline in 17th century Edinburgh and on Scottish connections to the Caribbean slave trade. For upcoming episodes we'll be featuring art history and medieval history as well, so please do give the podcast a listen. You can find it on all major podcasting platforms or through the links available on the Twitter page. Thanks very much. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 6. A Crisis by Monthly Installments Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last week, we saw how Charles I's long-anticipated return to the nation of his birth was underwhelming. No, that's not right. It wasn't underwhelming. It was an utter disaster. All that the Presbyterian Scots had feared about their new king seemed to be true. From their point of view, he promoted ceremonies with no scriptural basis. He was returning papist rituals to the true Kirk. The Scottish Church was overburdened with bishops, those royal minions, and gained even more after his visit. Perhaps their greatest fear, that their king wished to return the tyranny of the Pope to Scottish shores, perhaps that was also true. Of course, as we've already seen, Charles wanted no such thing. But that didn't change the optics of his actions. We left off with Charles imposing a new Book of Common Prayer, an adaptation of the English book with a few alterations for Scottish congregations. It was to be used in the upcoming Sunday service in the Diocese of Edinburgh on the 23rd of July, 1637. Presumably, Charles believed that this would set an example, and his religious reforms would spread across Scotland. It certainly set an example, though not the one the king hoped for. Instead, it would spark a series of events which have been coined a crisis by monthly instalments. On that Sunday morning, the new prayer book was due to be used in several services across the diocese. St Giles Cathedral was full to the brim with the great and the good of the Scottish capital. Members of the Privy Council, the city magistrates, the Lords of the Session, two archbishops including Archbishop Spottiswood of St Andrews, and several lesser bishops, including the Bishop of Edinburgh. These worthies took their seats. The rest of the cathedral was full of parishioners from across the city, and many had brought their own seats. The limited pews were taken by the elite, of course. The dean of the cathedral rose to the pulpit to read from the new book. As he began speaking, the common parishioners began shouting, swearing, clapping, making as much noise as possible to drown him out. There were cries of, Whoa, whoa, and they are bringing popery among us. In this uproar, chairs and stools started being thrown at the poor dean. Famously, one Jedi Geddes is said to have been the first person to start throwing her stool, and by stool, I of course mean her seat. She's gone down in history as an icon of rebellion, of freedom, of Scottish patriotism or Scottish nationalism, a feminist resistance to the patriarchy and every other cause that can be attached to her. She even has a plaque in her honour in St Giles today. Sadly, it's debated whether Jenny Geddes even existed, or rather whether Jenny Geddes became a representation of the entire congregation. Certainly the printers who spread word of the events in St Giles found it very convenient to have a single hero to centre events upon. Whether Jenny existed or not... She was certainly not alone in throwing things at the dean. Taking pity on the poor dean, the Bishop of Edinburgh rose and took his place, calling for calm amongst the congregation and trying to restore order. His reward was to get stools thrown at him instead. Clearly they had to bring in the big guns, and now Archbishop Spottiswood took over, 
Spottiswood had been resistant to the new prayer book, but, as a loyal agent of the crown, had followed his king's orders. He was little better at crowd control than his colleagues. Abuse was shouted at him, and after he ordered bailiffs and the provost to clear the room, the dissidents just banged on the doors and threw stones at the church windows. Despite all of this disruption, the service was completed, but the crowd hadn't gone away. After doing what they could to disrupt the service from outside, once it was finished, they surrounded the bishops as they tried to leave, and relentlessly shouted abuse at them. This was just at St. Giles Cathedral. The same service was held in its neighbouring church, and faced only a slightly reduced level of outrage. Elsewhere in the city, at Greyfriars Kirk, the minister gave up trying to read from the new prayer book in the face of the abuse, and when news of these disorders reached the college kirk, the service was just cancelled. These were only the morning services. For the afternoon service, the authorities did what they could to prevent disturbances within church buildings, but they lost control of the streets, where angry crowds had congregated since the morning. Attendees of these services, including some of the highest-ranking men of the kingdom, were pelted with rocks and excrement and abuse as they left. Robert Kerr, the Earl of Roxburgh, had to stand with his retinue and fight off the rioters at sword point. He was protecting the Bishop of Edinburgh, who was apparently so terrified of the riot that he became incontinent. When the launch of your new prayer book ends with bishops soiling themselves, something has gone wrong. Official reports of the disorder blame the riots on rascally servicing women, and the scum and throth of the people. There were rumours that the women throwing stools in St Giles were actually apprentice boys in disguise. However, the prayer book riot was not a spontaneous event. Remember, the book had been in the works for years at this point. The Book of Canons had been published in Aberdeen the year before, and this new service book had been published in Edinburgh in April. Opponents of Charles's innovations therefore had more than 15 months to prepare. Last week, I touched on how the new liturgy was picked apart by Scottish critics for its errors, but I didn't go into detail. The canons were concerning for a number of reasons. They made no commitment about the General Assembly's authority to govern the Kirk, and instead threatened excommunication upon any clergy or laity who refused to acknowledge the royal supremacy. Opposing Episcopal government, or further changes to the liturgy, and attempting to raise the presbytery over the bishops, likewise would be punished with excommunication. The prayer book had a few of the most offensive English elements removed, but remained an inflammatory document. Neither book had come about through consultation with a general assembly of the Kirk, instead being imposed by royal will. They were simply unconstitutional. As McInnes states, they were both held to suborn the received reformed tradition. The association of religious uniformity with thorough led liturgical innovation to be viewed as a step too far in the relegation of Scotland from a kingdom to a province. With the Bishop of Edinburgh's proclamation the previous week, that the prayer book would be used at the next week's service, the opponents of Charles's religious reforms, the disaffected, as McInnes titles them, had time to prepare. This was not a random outbreak of civil disobedience. This had been planned since April, and the leadership included high-ranking members of the nobility, including Lord Balmerino, who had only recently been on trial for his life. Part of this planning included the decision that the women of the congregation would be the vanguard. They would begin proceedings, and the men would follow after. So, the rumours of disguised apprentice boys were false. Similarly, the official reports which blamed the poor for the riot were incorrect. Many of the women in St Giles, who had led the charge, were far from the poorest dregs of society. They were established members of the Edinburgh community, fiercely Presbyterian wives and daughters of the Burgesses. Also, while the riot was planned, that doesn't mean it was insincere. There may have been instigators ready to act on that fateful Sunday, but the thousands of rioters were genuinely outraged. The prayer book became a focal point for opposition to Charles's religious policy. 
and it brought home the reality of these reforms to ordinary people. Where before your average Scot might have been vaguely aware of royal interference in their kirk, but really, how often was your average Scot going to actually see a bishop, especially if they lived outside the towns? The prayer book was a different matter entirely. Every church was meant to have a copy, and it was meant to be used in every service. As Kenyon and Olmeyer nicely put it, the new prayer book also offered them a tightly focused, easily understood issue on which to rally public opinion. And, in the classic tradition of subjects opposing their monarch's policies, the figure of Archbishop William Lord as the evil counsellor responsible for these innovations, well, that helped too. This allowed opponents of Charles' policies to avoid outright criticising their king, which was still a bridge too far for many. The rioters in the streets were a broad spectrum of Edinburgh society, and some came from even further afield. Again, the interconnected nature of the Three Kingdoms meant that even this event was not isolated to Scotland. Even before the riot, the tension over the new canons and the new prayer book was not subtle, and authorities in the other two kingdoms grew concerned. Notably, Bishops in Ireland began cracking down on their Presbyterian parishioners, expelling many from Ireland and sending them back to Scotland. Some of these former settlers took part in the riot. As the Scottish crisis develops, more Scots will return from Ireland to stand with their kirk. Eventually, Lord Deputy Wentworth will try and block both the return of former Scottish settlers as well as new colonists, fearing, correctly, that the network of Presbyterian opposition to royal policy spanned all three kingdoms. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In the aftermath of the riot, the authorities in Edinburgh and London tried to work out what to do. The Scottish Privy Council and the bishops agreed that they needed to pause the rollout of the prayer book, and on the 29th of July, 1637, the use of the book was suspended until they received word from the king. That word arrived quickly. Use the prayer book, and protect the ministers who used it. And so, probably with a deep sigh of resignation, the Privy Council gave the order on the 9th of August. The next day, on the 10th of August, the Episcopacy reiterated the order that Kirk ministers purchase two copies of the new book, and Glasgow erupted into riots. After all, there was no way the Glaswegians were going to let Edinburgh make history without them. What did the Privy Council do in response to this? Absolutely nothing. On the 24th or 25th of August, I've seen both dates, they decided to halt the enforcement of the new prayer book and await the king's instruction. Presumably, they hoped that these additional examples of Scottish resistance might convince the king to tread carefully. To similarly avoid escalating the situation, the Scottish government also refused to arrest the rioters. Matters weren't helped by the council's own division between the bishops and the laity, between those who supported the reforms and those who opposed them. Depicted as instruments of an English provincialisation of Scotland, the bishops were resented and politically isolated on the council, and they had been since at least the trial of Balmerino. The council was internally divided, and often in disagreement over what to do, They entered a holding pattern, refusing to progress with the king's instruction, but unable to retreat without his approval. And that approval was not coming. Both Lord and Charles agreed that, despite the volatile situation in Scotland, their religious policy had to proceed. If they offered concessions to the Scots, which was perhaps sensible, it would open another can of worms in England. Appeasing Scottish Calvinists would only invigorate their English co-religionists. So Charles repeated his earlier order, enforce the prayer book. However, all of this discussion took time, and the disaffected used this time well. Over the following weeks, more than a third of the Scottish nobility, allied with large numbers of gentry, clergy, and town burgesses from across the kingdom, brought 68 petitions from Scottish towns, parishes, and presbyteries to Edinburgh. Here, they applied pressure to the Privy Council 
and on the 20th of September these petitions were combined into a single national petition. It called for an end to religious innovation, backed by vast sections of Scottish society. Did the government, and by extension Charles, take this as the basis of a constructive compromise and respond to this clear demonstration of political and religious opinion? Of course not. Enforcement of the prayer book remained official policy, and so another month passed. In the third week of October, the next instalment of the Scottish crisis occurred. After weeks of government intransigence, an offer of amnesty was proclaimed, However, this concession came with no promises about the religious reforms and with a warning against further unrest. Naturally, Edinburgh once again erupted into riots, larger and more violent than the initial outburst in July. These riots were followed by the National Supplication, drafted by David Dixon and Sir Archibald Johnston, a minister and lawyer respectively. The supplication called for the godly to put everything on the line for the cause, or else face damnation for breach of our covenant with God and forsaking the way of true religion. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022, but like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code Recorded History. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code Recorded History. Babbel language for life. After October's riots and supplication, came the November instalment of the crisis, and yet again, the dispute escalated. The opponents of uniformity organised the Four Tables, councils of nobles, gentry, ministers, and burgesses. If that sounds familiar, it should. These were the estates of Scotland, which had been cooperating informally with one another to organise resistance to the religious policy. Now, the Tables had become ominously close to a provisional government. Luckily, they were not operating in a vacuum. After all, the Scottish Privy Council was still in Edinburgh. And then, the Scottish Privy Council left Edinburgh, heading a few miles west to Linlithgow Palace on Charles's order, and now the tables were a provisional government. In December, a fifth executive table was arranged, mostly made up of nobility, but joined by representatives from the other estates. McInnes makes a point of describing this fifth table as a revolutionary executive, but that's a debate for another episode. This table rotated its membership frequently, allowing members to return to their home regions, as well as depriving the king of a permanent leadership, which could be targeted or compromised. From December to February, the tables continued to seek an accommodation with their monarch, repeatedly sending petitions complaining about his religious policies. Finally, on the 19th of February, 1638, Charles issued a proclamation backing down. Of course not, don't be ridiculous. He issued a proclamation alright, but he wasn't backing down. Charles stated that he had been involved in the drafting of the new liturgy, throughout the entire process. 
he had overseen it, and he had approved the final version. This would benefit the true religion, and any who continued to oppose it would be considered traitors. The reaction from the disaffected was as you might expect. From Harris, quote, By raising the stakes and declaring all opposition treasonous, Charles forced opponents of the prayer book into a different course of action. They decided to commission a band of mutual association, which was duly published as the National Covenant on the 28th of February, 1638. The National Covenant is an incredible document, which thoroughly, and I mean thoroughly, explains the Covenant of Cause. Exactly how Charles's religious reforms were evil and a danger to the true religion is spelled out in extensive detail. Throughout the Covenant, the authors go out of their way to state that they intend to defend the king's person and authority. However, this is always accompanied by their insistence on defending the true religion. The Covenant expresses their commitment to resist these errors and corruptions in every way, including, if necessary, armed opposition. Neither do we fear the foul aspersions of rebellion, combination, or what else our adversaries from their craft and malice would put upon us. Seeing what we do is so well warranted, and ariseth from an unfeigned desire to maintain the true worship of God, the majesty of our King, and the peace of the kingdom, for the common happiness of ourselves and posterity. In his History of Scotland, McInnes puts it thus, In effect, the king's person and royal authority were to be defended in so far as he accepted the religious and constitutional imperatives of the National Covenant. End quote. In other words, loyalty to the king and loyalty to the true religion were held up as equal, but one was more equal than the other. Along with this episode, I've released a bonus episode of me reading the National Covenant in its entirety, minus all the references to statute law. It's a lengthy text, and so I've kept it separate from this main episode for those who don't want or need to hear it. If you'd prefer to read it, I've included a link to a version on the Free Kirk website which I used. I resisted the urge to read it with a thick Scottish brogue, despite it really needing to be read like that, mainly because I wouldn't be able to keep up the accent for that long, also, it wasn't very good. More of an asthmatic Billy Connolly than anything particularly grand. Anyway, it's there for some additional flavour, but don't feel the need to listen. The Covenant was copied and spread throughout Scotland over the following weeks, and almost everywhere it gained subscriptions. Signatories were not limited to just the elite, and according to Julian Goodair, quite humble people subscribed and in some parishes just about every adult male householder. Much in the same way that the prayer book provided a physical example of royal interference, the real and tangible presence of the covenant, and what covenants represented, was a powerful draw. Kirk ministers preached in its favour, convincing their congregations of its importance, and it didn't hurt to bring peer pressure to bear on holdouts. Signatures were also acquired through barefaced coercion and threats. It's impossible to know how much of the Covenant's popularity was sincere and how many reluctant signatories bowed before pressures, subtle or otherwise. Regardless, after several weeks, the Covenant boasted the signatures of the majority of adult male householders, with the only holdouts being areas where resistance was to be expected, Episcopal sees like Aberdeen and St Andrews, and Catholic communities in the Highlands and Islands. Even here, however, the Covenant found supporters. To cap all of this off, seven members of the Privy Council signed it too. Throughout the crisis by monthly instalments, Charles had been stubborn, yes, but he had made limited attempts to bring the crisis to an end. However, his stubbornness and the distance between court and the events in Scotland meant that often by the time these concessions were received, they were too little too late. The amnesty only instigated further unrest. At one point, Charles agreed to withdraw the prayer book for it to be properly examined, but the disaffected had already increased their demands to attack the bishops and the Court of High Commission. By the time Charles began considering going this far, the National Covenant was in play. And throughout all of this, the division within the Privy Council certainly didn't help. 
We'll talk about the revolutionary, or not, nature of the National Covenant and the Covenant Accords in a future episode. To finish off today, we'll look at the aftermath. After the publication of the Covenant, Charles bitterly complained that, so long as this Covenant is in force, I have no more power in Scotland than as a Duke of Venice. In the King's eyes, these were rebels, and they had to be brought to heel. He dispatched James Hamilton, third Marquess of Hamilton, to try and settle affairs in the rebellious kingdom. Hamilton had points in his favour as a potential peacemaker. Firstly, he was Scottish. He had spent many years at the English court, but he could still argue that he was no Englishman sent to impose English rule. The second was that he could honestly claim innocence in the religious policies which had caused all this unrest. He himself was highly critical of the role of bishops, and he understood many of the motivations behind the covenant. The third was his personal intervention in support of Protestantism in the Thirty Years' War. He had led a joint Anglo-Scottish force in support of the King of Sweden, Gustavus Adolphus. Hamilton is a fascinating character, and if you'd like to learn more about his life before the Scottish crisis, then I'm pleased to announce a special patron-exclusive episode on him. This will hopefully be available over the next week to all members of the House of Lords of the rank of Earl and above. Despite these apparent strengths, Hamilton faced a titanic struggle with his countrymen. He would later write, quote, Joy I have little here, for little comfort can I have in being abhorred by my friends and kindred, hated by my nation in general, railed at in the streets, exclaimed against in the pulpits, and that in no other terms than that faggots is already prepared in hell for me. By the time he arrived in Edinburgh on the 9th of June 1638, he'd already suffered one embarrassing failure. After summoning more than a hundred clients and relatives to Dalkeith on the 5th, barely any turned up. He attempted to negotiate with the tables, but on the 20th, Hamilton wrote to his king and warned him of the dangers of trying to forcefully impose himself on Scotland. He would risk, quote, the hazarding of your three crowns if he tried. Hamilton repeatedly tried to warn Charles away from military force, In this, he had to push against the influence of many of the king's Scottish Catholic lords, who understandably feared a second reformation, and all that would entail for them. Throughout summer, Hamilton kept up negotiations between the two sides, working on Charles to please at least try and compromise. The king was not to be swayed. Quote, Flatter them with what hopes you please. So you engage me not against my grounds, and in particular, that you consent neither to the calling of Parliament nor General Assembly until the Covenant is disavowed and given up. Charles had set the requirement for discussing the demands of the Covenant on the surrender of the Covenanters themselves. Hamilton argued that if Charles offered to compromise, the Covenanter cause would become split between those who were satisfied and those who were not. Charles was not fully convinced, but he did need time to build up a sufficient military response. Quote, Win time until I be ready to suppress them. Of course, the king was not the only one building up military forces, as the Covenanters were not naive. Throughout summer, Hamilton went back and forth between court and Edinburgh. Eventually, in September, the king was convinced to grant some concessions, and on the face of it, they look more than reasonable. A parliament and a general assembly of the Kirk would be allowed to take place. The prayer book would be withdrawn, as would the new canons and the court of high commission. The five articles of Perth would be suspended until a parliament could gather to legally revoke them. The general assembly would be permitted to discuss the episcopacy, and the 1581 negative confession would be reissued in the king's name. This last one was most obviously a trap. In effect, this would replace the National Covenant with a document for the maintenance of religion, as it was already or presently professed. This would include the bishops and the articles, which were at the root of this unrest. Unsurprisingly, the King's Covenant didn't have quite the same level of popularity as its national competitor. The concessions seemed too good to be true, because they were. (laughs) 
the summons for a parliament were delayed, and when the General Assembly gathered in Glasgow in November, they were forbidden from actually discussing the episcopacy as promised. Hamilton had planned to weather the obvious reaction to this by packing the assembly with allies, and so control the agenda. Unfortunately for Hamilton, the Covenanters had had the same idea, but they'd actually done it. In addition to their general popularity, the Covenanters also intimidated and bribed their electoral opponents. The anti-Episcopalian ministers were joined by sympathetic members of the other three estates, who had been elected as ruling elders of their presbyteries, and so they came to the assembly as well. When the body opened, the Covenanter commissioners held an overwhelming majority. On top of this, the moderator of the assembly was Alexander Henderson, and the procurator was Archibald Johnston, two of the authors of the National Covenant. Predictably, the General Assembly began to attack every religious innovation since the Five Articles. The Assembly sat for a week before Hamilton decided that enough was enough. On the 28th of November, he declared the General Assembly dissolved. Only for everyone to just keep talking. Hamilton, surely feeling quite awkward, left the chamber and called a meeting of the Privy Council, which issued its own proclamation, stating that the General Assembly was dissolved. And yet, the General Assembly remained assembled, complete with the powerful Earl of Argyll and the Marquis of Montrose remaining in their places and lending the Assembly their authority. The still quite assembled General Assembly proceeded with their agenda. There had been six General Assemblies of the Kirk between 1606 and 1618. These were declared unlawful. The five Articles of Perth were formally revoked. The Court of High Commission was deemed illegal. The Episcopacy abolished. They passed acts requiring a General Assembly to meet annually, and of course, the spark of all of this, the new prayer book and canons, were denounced. By the time the Assembly dispersed, in December 1638, Charles's religious policy was in ruins, and the stage was set for war. Thank you to my House of Lords, which is now graced with the presence of the Right Honourable Earl and Countess of Salt Lake City, David and Margaret Simpson, the Right Honourable Earl of Roslyn, James Fee. They stand beside the royal favourites, Andrew Shoemaker and Mike Sanders, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Royal Headsman, executed today, the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin, the Duke of Ormond, Brendan Bonner, the Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer, the Marquess of Hereford, Christopher Remo, the Marquess of Queensbury, Brent Sitz, the Marquess of Southampton, Alan Goldstein, the Marquess of Dorset, Thomas Kessler, the Marquess of Annandale, Duncan McHale, the Marquess of Montague, Brandon Stansbury, Evan, Marquess of Londonderry. Thank you to Dr. Carrie Schultz for the introduction to today's episode. If you're interested in cutting-edge history in their researchers' own words, then have a listen to the Research in Scottish History podcast. Every month, Dr. Carrie Schultz interviews historians about their research in Scottish history. Right now, there is an interview with Dr. Claire McNulty about her thesis subject, the Edinburgh Church Courts under the Covenanters, as well as an interview with one of my own PhD colleagues, Matthew Lee, on Scotland and the slave trade. A link to the podcast will be in the show notes of this episode, so go and subscribe. That again is the Research in Scottish History podcast. As always, thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music used in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. <laughs>